So I'm having a little bit of Blue Monday in class. The screen has a blue tinge to it. I don't know what it is. I use two different adapters. I tried the screen and just have to deal. I don't know. Questions before we continue? Somebody had a question that came up to me before class that I want to pose to you. Can you have a recursive type? What would a recursive type be? Hmm? It's not possible. Why? It's going with the infinite uh, loop, and we need to stop somewhere. Right? Yeah, so it's a similar question. So it's a very broad question, right? But one thing could be, could it, the thing about with structs, right? Could a struct have itself its own type as a field of that struct? No. How could you ever create an object of that type? Right? A, you need infinite size, but there's no way to actually create that object. Similarly, you have a function that took itself as a type. How would you actually call that function? How could you write? What would that function signature be of something that to actually write that function? So there's really no difference between a structure that has itself as a field argument, as the type of its field, than as a function that either, let's say, returns itself as a parameter, or, or returns its own type as a parameter, or return, uh, accepts a parameter as its own type. Does that make sense? You guys know what I'm saying, right? I don't have to draw examples. Any other questions on this? I think on a related note, homework seven is due today. In case you didn't see that note on the manual list by one of your nice fellow students. Any other questions? The hundred of you that are here. All right. Cool. So let's move on. Okay. So at the end of Wednesday, we talked about, and actually, I'm, I don't know if you guys have looked, but we're about a month left in this semester. Don't be so happy. You'd be happy that you're moving on to other classes. You could be a little sad. It's like bittersweet if you're leaving the class. Right? We won't get to see each other again. But um, so yeah, so we're actually I'm super stoked about where we are. We have some really cool stuff to finish up here, and then we get to Lambda Calculus, and then we get to the end. Which, oh. I know. There we go. See, that's the proper response. Even if it's not true. Okay. So we talked about buffer overflow, we talked about calling convention. Now we're going to look at, we looked very briefly about how functions, how parameters were passed into our functions. So in CDECL calling convention that we just studied, how did a calling function pass parameters to the callee? Put it on the stack. But yeah, push it on the stack. But what did it actually push onto the stack? So it, it copied that value, right, and pushed it onto the stack. So we had essentially a new copy of that value onto the stack. So when looking at it from a semantic perspective, what are the semantics of passing parameters to a function? So in C or C++, what does it mean when you pass parameters into a function? Let's say you assign to that parameter in that function, what happens? Not a rhetorical question. Semantically, what happens? What do you expect to happen when you call a function passing in parameters? Same values are passed to uh, same function. I mean, parameters type checking. And yes, so parameter types you have to check. Yep. Actual values are passed, so I can access exactly those values when the function executes. Right, so you get the same values that are passed in? Yeah. What does that mean? So we know 
one's called pass by value, but maybe we haven't thought really hard about what that actually means and what that means semantically, right? And so we we'll see there's multiple types of approaches, pass by value, pass by reference, and pass by name. In some languages, like you know, in C++, you can actually specify you want a certain variable to be passed by reference when you're defining a function. Pass by name is something that we'll see that really kind of stretches your mind about what actually is a function call. Um, so that's why it's really fun to look at. Um, okay, so the key part about pass by value is that the values of the actual parameters are copied to the function. So the function operates over copies of the parameters that are passed in. Right? This is why if you assign to a parameter inside of a function, it does not get reflected outside of that function. Right? The actual parameter doesn't change. And we've seen, and this is why we say this for here, we don't talk about it in semantics, because we've seen exactly how this is implemented in x86 using C. Right? How C code is compiled and how it implements this. It literally takes a copy of that value and copies it onto the stack. Right? So to the, C, to the computer, these are physically different values. Right? Some local variable A was at EDP minus something, and now it's on the stack again because it's going to be called and passed to some other function. Oh, these are weird. Okay. So we have our program main. Oh, I think I know where I'm going with this. Okay. We have uh, y is equal to 4, we call test y, we print out the value of y, then we return y. So now in our test function, we take in some parameter x. It's really weird looking. It's kind of hypnotic almost. It's like a weird hinge. OK. Uh, so then we set x is equal to x plus 5, and we print out the value of x. So what is this program going to output? In what order? Nine and then four, right? So we know we're going to set y equal to four. We're going to call test y. We're going to pass in y here. And we're going to copy that value four into this parameter x. And we're going to say x is equal to x plus five. So that will make this x that's internal to test be nine. We will print out nine. Then we return y didn't change, right? We passed by the value. We copied that value into the function. Cool. So we can, oh, there's the solution on there. That's cool. Uh, OK, so we can compile it, run it. We'll see it outputs 9 and 4 because this is GCC C semantics that we're all familiar with. right? And the question is how to think about this using the tools we know of how to think about semantics. right? And so we know when we see main, we have a box circle diagram with y. So we know we have a local variable y in main, which means we have a name y, it is bound to some location, and what's the value inside that location? Four. Yes. Now, when we call test, what does that mean for x in our box circle diagrams? Let's create another box. Create another box. So we have the name x bound to another box. And at function invocation time, what's going to be the value inside that box? Four. Four. We are copying the value that's inside y and putting it into the location associated with x. So we copy four there. Then we say x is equal to x plus five. We know exactly how to do this semantics, right? We're saying take the value in the location associated with x, add five to it, and then copy that into the value into the location, the value at the location associated with x which is going to change x to be 9. Then when we print out x, we print out the value of the location associated with x, which is 9. And then when we return, what happens to this x box? You destroy it. You it. it gets automatically deallocated, right? So this box goes away. Gone forever. Right? And then when we print out y, now we're printing out the value 4. Right? And now isn't it incredibly obvious and clear that y should never be changed? Right? From this box circle diagram, inside test we created a new box for x. And we copied the value 4 onto there. So any changes just happen there. And then when it goes away, it gets automatically deallocated because it's allocated on the stack. 
And now we have y has the value 4. So any questions on this? This should be pretty, uh, pretty familiar because this is what you're used to, right? All right. Now we get to the fun stuff, pass by reference. So what's the difference for people that are familiar with C++ that have used this? Yeah, so it's, well, how it does it under the hood, we don't really care about, right? It could do it in a number of different ways. The point is that when we assign to that variable, we are now assigning to that actual parameter that was passed in, right? So the way to think about this is that now, instead of our parameters having their own boxes, at function invocation time, the parameters are now bound to the same box that was passed in, right? And this will then help us think about how to think and do pass by reference. So this means that the actual parameters must be L values. We can never pass in an R value to a pass by reference. Why? We need an address. Yeah, we need. We need a location, right? Because we can write to that value. We need to write to some location. We need to bind the parameter, let's call it x, to some location. And so if you tried to pass in 5 plus 10, that's not a location. That's just a value. That's an r value. Cool. Let's look at an example. Oh, this one's a little fixed. OK, we have the same thing. OK, so we have the exact same code. But now here I'm using C++ syntax to say I'm passing in x by reference. So that's what the ampersand there means. Which is kind of cool because it means that now I don't have to change this code at all. Right? And the compiler will just know what to do. So, now when I compile this, what's it going to do? Is it going to give me any errors? Yes, on what? The function call is not proper in the past. No errors? No errors. No errors. So why? The argument for the function is has an ambassador. Yes, so this is the key. So this is what tells this means that under the hood we know it's basically passing in the address of y here and then it's uh, setting that by dereferencing it. It's basically turning all these x's into pointers. Right? But by using it by reference like this. We don't have to worry about that or think about that. The compiler can do it however it wants to do it. That's why we don't pass in the address of y here, because that would be passing in an int star when this function only takes in an int that it's going to do pass by reference on. And the key thing is this pass by reference is part of the function signature. right? So when we invoke the function, the compiler knows exactly what to do. It knows, aha, this first parameter is a pass by reference parameter. So I may need to compile this call differently. OK, what's it going to output? 9 and 9. 9 and 9? Yes. Cool. And y. So we can see, just like before, we have y equals 4. We have a, a name called y bound to some location. We're going to put the value 4 in there. Now when we invoke test, Right now we're just binding x to that same location that it was called from. So right, instead of creating our own box, now we're binding the name x to that location that it was invoked at. And now when we see x is equal to x plus five, we're going to change the take the value of the location associated with x, which is four, add five to it, and then copy it into the value of the location associated with x, which is here. And then when it returns, now x, the name x goes away, but the box remains. Questions passed by reference? Yes? Uh, shouldn't x be in a box, and in that box should be the address of y? That may be how it's implemented, but that's not how we can think. We don't need to think about it like that in the semantic way. Because from our perspective, this is exactly what happens. Right? There is no box for x. It just binds the name x to whatever location was passed in. However the compiler implements that doesn't really matter for us. 
right? Because to us, we don't know that underneath x is actually a pointer when it compiles down. All we see that is x is an integer. And here we see, yeah, x is an integer, right? Yeah? So if uh, it's uh, in ampersand x is at, uh, in some function, even then we don't, uh, in the box circle diagram, we won't make the box, right? Because it would mess with what it actually does. So you have an ampersand here? If anywhere else in the function itself, in the function definition somewhere it's there and we are making box circle diagram. Not related to this, but this, we are still making a box circle diagram. So this is part of the problem with C++, right? Is they're overloading the ampersand symbol in multiple different ways. I think by itself it would be with two arguments. Does it do bitwise and? Or is that just what sync? A bar, a single bar is or, a caret is xor. So I think a single ampersand with two arguments is going to do bitwise and. And then an ampersand unary applied to one thing is going to take the address of that thing. And two ampersands are going to do and, Boolean and. And then a single ampersand on a type here in the language is going to do pass by reference. So those are all completely different operations, right? So if we were trying to pass in address of y, well, A, that would not type check. B, so let's go back to the previous example. Right, if we were to pass in here address of Y, we would copy the address associated with Y, let's call it W, we would copy that into X, and that's what would be inside X. So we can still do the address of operator, but that's why we've been calling it address of operator, and not ampersand, because ampersand is very confusing, right? Other questions? Yeah, so if you're passing yes. Amazon um, with Y, then if there's a pointer there, int star x in the function, then we we have a box and then we pass the uh, Yes. So let's do that. Wow, that looks really ugly for some reason. I don't know if it's too zoomed in. Huh? Oh, is that why? Maybe. Nope. No. No, that's just bad. Yeah, it's just bad, bad fonts. Okay. Okay, so we want to change this to this int pointer like this, and this to ampersand, and then we need to change it like this, right? Cool. So here I have y. I have a box associated with y. I have four, what's the address of y? Address y, y. Yeah, but somebody give me a, give me a number. Alpha. What was it? Alpha. It's not a number, alpha is a symbol. All right, ff. So now, so I'm passed by value, right? And so I have x, x has a box associated with it. It's going to be at 100. That's probably not right. But 104, let's do something like that. I don't know. Right? And so what's the value going to be inside x? 0xff. Right? So now, where, so if I were to draw star x on this diagram, where would I point to? Y? Well, like this? I hope you didn't do that on your exam. <laughs> but now you won't on the next one. Right? So now here when I say star x is equal to star x plus 5, what's going to change in this diagram? Yeah, this will now be 9. And then when I return, what's it going to print out? 9. So this is exactly what the compiler is doing underneath. It's just doing it so that you don't have to worry about it. So this is pass by value. This is basically pass by value, which is working as a reference. It is pass by value simulating pass by reference, yes. <laughs> right? But the key part is that this OXFF is copied into here. Right? So that if I were to do this.
right? If I were to do this, now before the function returns, what's going to happen? It's going to change the values. It's going to change the value inside x to just be four a's, which I realize I don't have a ton of space for. Now we're going to start x point two. Somewhere else. Oh. Right? It'll actually probably be a segmentation fault. But do I ever dereference x? No, so I won't get a segmentation fault. And then when I return, what happens to this box? Goes away, it gets destroyed, right? So did that change the value in y? Or the thing that y is pointing to? Yes. No, it changed, well, it changed the value inside y, but this didn't change anything to do with y. Right? So this is why if you ever wanted to, in your projects, if you ever want to malloc something and set it, set a pointer to be something that you mallocked or created, some memory that you created from the heap, you need to pass in an int star star into that function. Let's go through an example. I'm seeing lots of blank faces. Avoid. Uh, So here we have x. X is a pointer. What's the address of x? Unknown. Sure, we'll do ff again because it's. Did you say a million? No, I said unknown. Oh, unknown. Yeah, okay. We'll give it a value though. Okay, then we call get them x. What's in? I'm uh, sorry. What's the value inside of x? Unknown. That is definitely unknown. I'm going to just draw a symbol. Now, pass by reference, or pass by value, right? Pointer, PTR, is a name. It's going to be bound to some location. What's going to be inside pointer? After the invocation? Yes, after this invocation. Or when this function's invoked. So, it's a pass by value, I guess. So yes, pass by value. That this thing. Yeah, it's the squiggly thing gets passed into here. And then so when we have int malloc, so malloc's going to return, so malloc is going to create a new box for us that's of size int. It is, let's call it uh, a, because I don't want to draw anymore. So what's going to change about pointer? The circle will stop. That thing will change to zero x. And then this function returns, and then what happens? Nothing. This goes away. So now when I dereference star x, what happens? Segmentation fault, because I'm trying to dereference memory inside here. Right? Because what gets passed in is a copy of x, right? We pass by value, even, and this is the important part, even though I'm passing in a pointer, I cannot change what x points to. I can change the thing that x points to, but I can't change what x itself actually points to. Uh, but uh, when we pass an array, so normally array is a pointer. Yes. And it changes the array. It changes the array because an array is a pointer to something. So when you pass that in, you're passing in the address of your array element, so you can change it. You can't make that original array point to a different array. To do that, you have to change this, and you either have to do, well, yeah, you have to do int star. Yeah. Then you need to pass in the address of x. 
Now we have x that has something in it. At memory location 0x ff. I have pointer. So now when this gets invoked, what's the value inside pointer? Now, after the malloc returns, it returns me 0xA, where, what changes? Star PTR, which is here. So this is going to change this in here to 0xA. Now when this returns, this all goes away. And I have x pointing to this new memory location. So if you ever wondered why you couldn't get memory allocated and returning it, this is why, with pointers. And then maybe you gave up. I think I've seen some of this code in my office hours. I think I told that person, wait until we get to this part because you'll understand. Cool. Questions on this? Relationship between pass by value, pass by reference. Yeah. So we go back to the example where we're using pass by reference by using the ampersand syntax. Yep. Um, what happens when you do an address of operator on x, like inside the test function? Is that going to be the same as address of y? Or is it going to, I imagine since it's on the stack, actually have its own address, but. It would be the address of y because it it's bound, be to, okay. it's, x is bound to y, so they okay. share the same location. Mm -hmm. So if you took the address of that. Does you, that mean that it goes up the stack back to the previous function in order to find it? I don't know. Let's try it out. Okay, so what do we want to do? Let's print out, I think if we just print out uh, like the address of x, yeah. I think that should give us something super interesting. And if we maybe print out here the address of y. And let's do it before and after just to make sure. Uh oh, percent X, I want percent P. This is why you use warnings. Yep. So it is the same thing. Okay, now. Now I'm curious as to how it actually does that. Oh, I'll accept it's, I wonder, wait a minute, this is on a Mac. Let's see what it's gonna do. <laughs> Let's see, so we're calling, uh, it doesn't even keep the symbols. All right, take two seconds to boot up my VM, I think. Now I'm really curious as to how it actually yeah. does this. Plus plus. Okay. Also did the same thing. Oh, right. But you guys forgot to remind me. We want to compile this with 32 bits. Oh. Oh man, I don't have the C plus plus standard library. I think we've reached the end of our rope. Don't want to compile this and tell me what it does. Nobody? All right, I have one more VM to try. And then, let's see, G++, uh, M32, test on CPP. Yeah. How do I not, I guess I never use C++. 
Anybody know the packages to install on CentOS to compile? The, I need the 32-bit C++ standard library. That's what's missing. All right. Okay, I just want to see the symbols in there compiled with tech G. But it still doesn't. Like it has two call functions in here. That's what I don't understand. Oh, printf. We have printf test. I see. We have printf test. Print F again? No, that's not right. Hmm, I don't know, I've never looked at that. Cool. Somebody can quickly find CentOS 7 C++ standard libraries. I'll install it and we can try it. Any other questions? No, we're all just waiting on pins and needles for this yum command. Okay, while well we're looking that up, we'll then go to pass by name. So pass by name is much, well, okay, so it's very different. It can be simulated with pass by value, but in a super weird way that's not very intuitive. Um, the idea is, and it actually maybe makes more sense when you think, I mean, if you think about Programming and trying to think of what these things actually mean. I don't know if you can think back that far and put yourself in the mindset you were in when you first learned how to think about functions and function calls. So in pass by name, every place we see x, the parameter in the function, we're going to textually replace it with whatever the actual parameter is, the text of the actual parameter. So for instance, it would mean that when we invoke it here with address of y, it's exactly the same thing as if test was written not like this, but was written as which doesn't really work here, which would cause an error. But this is the exact uh, way. So we go back to our original example, getting rid of this, let's change this to ampersand. So in pass by name, I'm going to literally, essentially textually replace, what did I do? Ah, stupid buttons. I'm going to textually replace all those x's with y. And so if I did that, and let's say, so they're also in the same scope. So they're in the same scope as the function of where they were called. So all these y's refer to this y. So then if I print this out, what am I printing out? Nine. Yeah, so I'm actually changing that value. So then, so this is basically the definition. We're doing textual replacement. But for this we need uh, dynamic binding, right? Then only by can be accessed in that function. That's Not necessarily. You need some tricks. Yeah. yeah, there are ways to do it. And we'll kind of see how it's implemented. And that can give you a flavor for how it's actually done. But it's a little bit more advanced to go into how exactly that's done. Do you have a thing? It says it's, it's recommending doing a group install on development tools. So How do I do a group install? Uh, Pseudo yum group install is one word. And then space um, quotation development space tools quotation. I think I already have this, but we'll see. Oh, and it'll use the ASU Wi Fi. So this will be over in a second. Oh, yep, lib C double. But I think it's C it's but it's installing all the x86 64 how do i install the group 
Yeah, how do I install the group 32 bit? Close. For CentOS, you have to add in 5386 to your uh, repository. I don't know. I think that takes some time. Yeah, I don't remember. I know I did it for GCC. Like, you can see up here. So like it's libgcc, the the 32-bit version. So, yeah. I don't know. It says, all right, so let's try this. Yum space install space lib stdc plus plus dot. Yep. Oh. Wait, oh, sorry. I'm not typing. Oh. I should, probably should have said. <laughs> <laughs> I want to shout out other random letters to the yeah. class. All right, this is updating. It's going to update 50. We'll get back to this after names. OK, so this is actually that same example. So we have y. So the idea is with, with pass by name, we're literally creating a new copy of that function where that parameter x now means y. And if we had some crazy version of GCC where we could compile this and pass by name, we would get 9 just in the same case uh, when in the same function that was passed by value. So at first glance, this seems like, oh, clearly this is just pass by reference. It's just a different weird way to think about pass by reference. So when does it make a difference? So let's assume we have some global i. We have a, we have a, an array, a global array a of 10 elements. Then we have a function called increment, which takes s, it increments i, and then increments x. In our main function, we set i equal to 1. We set a1 equal to 1, a2 equals to 2, then we increment ai. So what's it going to print out? So what would it print out in pass by value? This is the easy stuff. This is the stuff you do every day. It's only like six lines of code. What's it going to print out for i? Two. So this also goes to illustrate the evils of global variables. Right? Trying to answer the question, what is i when it is updated here and also in this function? So it depends on how many times this function is called, right? This should try to motivate you to not include global variables in your own code. Because it becomes incredibly difficult to reason about the code and what it's doing. Cool. OK, pass by value. What about pass by reference? So i is still going to be 2. But what's going to be printed out? 2 and 2. Right? So in pass by reference, it's going to bind x to this location ai. And that ai is going to be evaluated at function invocation time. So that ai will point to a1. Right? And so that box containing a1 is going to be, is going to be bound to x. When we increment x, it's going to change that from 1 to 2. So a1 will be 2, and a2 will also be 2. And i will also be 2. So it'll be 2's across the board. So now, in pass by name, what is it going to do? Oh, return to. Right? So the important thing to think about is we're doing textual replacement, right? We are replacing x with a bracket i. And remember, the important thing to remember is it's the scoping rules where it was introduced. So this means this i here is bound, well, okay, it's the same i. But this i here is bound to this global i. And that means when we do textual replacement for pass by name, it is still bound to that global i. It's not going to magically be bound to whatever i is inside the increment. So maybe that answers your question about dynamic scoping. So what does this function look like? We have increment ai, and we first increment i, and then we do ai++. So now what is this going to change? Yeah, so a2 is now going to be 3. So this is going to output 2, 1, 3. Right? i is still going to be 2, a1 is still going to be 1, and a2 is going to be 3. Yeah, on a fake compiler that actually implements this. 
questions on this? This is pretty tricky. It makes for some interesting uh, problems. So, so I declare uh, local variable integer i inside increment? Yes. That will be a type error, right? No. Uh, no. Syntax error. No. Same declare error. Nope. Because i is bound to that thing. Yep. So this i would now refer to your local i. And it would increment that. So here, let's look at this. Yeah. So just a of i is i inside a of i is bound to lo global one. Oh. Everything else will be local. Yes, I think so. So there's a way I can change this font. Font not great in the way of font options. Do you want it bigger, smaller, or not this at all? Uh, there was preferences. Yeah, but I don't know what that's going to do. It's going to. Oh, okay. Uh, just font. Uh, before font. Before. Uh, I want. What's the monospace Tom? Font? Maybe see any? I actually can't remember what it is on. Is it courier? Yeah. Courier news? Yes. Is it good enough? Oof. Looks ugly. All right, whatever. Gotta go with what you got. Okay. Right. So let's say it's equal to ten or zero, whatever. Right. So now, I global i is one. So what does this i refer to here? One. So it just moved. This global. So this i is one, which refers to a global i. So it's still static scoping. So this i refers to this global i. So when we basically do our replacement here. When we replace this x with ai, that ai came from this scoping, so that i refers to the global i. So it will still increment, well, it will increment a1. So it will be 1, 2, 2. Excuse me, because this i will not change, this i plus plus will change this local i and not the global i. So this i refers to this i, but when we replace a of i here, from here, because it came from that scope, it still refers to the global i. It doesn't change just because you're doing pass by name. So basically we're saying, hey, at every point in x, invoke your invoke this thing again to get me a new value. All right, you got something for me? Yeah, hopefully. All right, let's try yum install compat dash libstdc plus plus dash 296.i686. Oh, sorry. Oh. Sorry. 296.i686. Oh. Wow, good job. Okay, now the question is does this thing actually work? Duh. It's clearly the wrong lib. That's weird. Let's try it. Hey, the docs. No, but see, it's doing x86. Ah. You could try like yum search or something. Yeah. Why use Ubuntu? But all right. Okay. So let's go back here. I have another example. Cool. Okay. So. Now we have another example. We have a global i. We have a local uh, global function called p, which takes in a parameter y. It sets a local variable j to be y. It does i plus plus, and then it returns j plus y. So now we have a function q. We set j to be 2. We set i global i to be 0. And then we print out what's the return of calling function p and passing in i plus j. And in our main function, we just call q and then return 0. So what would this return, what would this print out in pass by value? So let's get here to Q. J is 2, global I is 0. What are we passing into P? 2. 2. Passing it in by value, so we're copying it in, 2. So Y is now 2, so J is now 2. We increment I, what was I? 0. 0, so it's now 1, so we're returning 2 plus 1. 
2 plus 2, sorry, you got you right. 2 plus 2, which is 4. I guess it's just, well, if you look at this pass by value, it looks like it just doubles it, right? It doubles the parameter and increments i. So it should print out 4. But once we take this i plus j, right, we take that expression, and every place we see y in the function body, we're going to reevaluate that expression. So this is going to be j is equal to i plus j, but remember the i here is this global i, and the j here is this local j, local to q, not local to p. So it's going to look like this. j is equal to i plus j. So what's i plus j at this moment? It's going to be 2. And then we do i plus plus. So i is now 1. Then we return j, which was 2, plus i plus j. 3, which is going to return 5. Pretty crazy, right? No. Different ways of thinking. Ah. Right, so a couple important things here. Right, This J and this J are not the same thing. Right, that's one of the most important things. Huh? So it's um, older, older programming languages. I believe Ada uses it. I want to say Fortran is an option. Some of the other languages. It's actually um, it can be faster in some sense. It basically is function inlining. So you're automatically doing function inlining. So back in the day, when you're worried about function call overhead, you're like, hey, why don't I use this and then get rid of you know, then I don't have to worry. I, each function call in the code doesn't have to be an actual function call. Um, it's also fairly easy to implement from a compiler perspective. Yeah. Oh, uh, the five is just only for the pass by name, right? Pass by uh, value is still four. Yes. Okay. Yes. This is just in a GCC that does pass by name. Yeah. Um, but as you can see here, right? They they were like, oh, this is great. It's simple. It kind of makes intuitive. I mean, a little bit intuitive sense. When you think about what does passing parameters to a function do? Well, you just replace it with whatever you pass, right? That can maybe be an easier conceptual way to think about functions if you weren't so seeped in this model of pass by value, right? But you get into these crazy situations where you're evaluating these expressions and they can change based on where in the function that they're being changed. So they basically like, the whole community kind of switched away from pass by name for future languages. But you can still think you could do it. And so the question is, how can you do this? Because it seems very different, right? So how can you get this same behavior using pass by value? So we saw we can simulate pass by reference using pointers. So how can we do this behavior with pass by value? So it kind of takes a little trick. Um, OK, so if we have. Uh, let's see. What's this example? Okay, yeah, this is a good example. Sorry. That's the next slide. This one, we have a function foo with a parameter that's never used. Here we have a local variable a. We're passing in b is equal to foo a plus plus. And we're printing out a and b. We return 0. So substituting an a plus plus in the function doesn't change anything. So this is still going to print out 0. It should be uh, 0 and 10. Because a is because the parameter is never used, it's never actually changed. This expression is never evaluated. So this is very similar to kind of lazy parameter passing and lazy evaluation. But it's only it's evaluated every time it's actually used. Okay, how do you actually do this? So back to our other example, we have i, we have our p, and we have q and main. So what we're going to do, we're going to simulate this. By having q, we're going to essentially take that i plus j, and we're going to turn it into a function. And then every time in here when we have y, we're going to call a function. And that will evaluate what's the current value of i plus j and return a value, and we'll use that. And then later on when we use y, we'll call it again. So this is how you can simulate pass by name with pass by value. Um, uh, sorry, the ordering is a little weird here. Q, so we have J is equal to 2. So I lifted J to be a global variable. Um, 
It depends on your language. You don't have to do that. And so we have I plus J returns I plus J. So global I plus global J. And now I change P to pass in a function pointer called Y, which, what does it take in? Nothing. Nothing. Zero parameters and it returns an integer. And so it's just like before, except everywhere I have Y, I'm now having a function call. So I say J is equal to Y, I plus plus, and then I return J plus Y called as a function. So now the second time of calling y, right, the value of i has been incremented, so i plus j is going to return a new value. Cool. Questions? Yeah, the last slide. Yes. Uh, the previous slide? Yeah, this is, I think, the last slide. But depends on where we go. We only evaluate, it's used in a parameter. We only evaluate that when it's used in the function. And we didn't assign it to it. Exactly. We never use that value test anywhere in the function. If we did, every time we use test, it would be incremented. A would be incremented. But because we don't, it's never incremented. So we're not evaluating these, right? In pass by value, we need to evaluate these and then pass in the result. Here, we're evaluating them every time they appear in the function body. Which gets test into will be replaced by a plus plus. What will be? If, if yes. I use in the body, yes. Not a a plus plus. Yes, it will be replaced by a plus plus. So I thought you the value will be incremented and then it will be replaced instead of test. So what is the difference if you pass plus plus a and if you pass a plus plus? Madness, which is why I'm not going to do that in this example. Okay. It's way too much. In pass by name? Yeah, no, we have no restriction. Uh, well, it depends on where it's used, right? So we could end up using test in the wrong place. Like if we tried to say test is equal to something and the left hand side is A plus plus, yeah. So you'd need some runtime type checking to make sure that that made sense. Yeah, good check. Cool, let me see. Ah, okay, we have one more thing to do here and then we're gonna get to land the calculus, so. Cool. Oh, wow, we went late, sorry.